The world economy is hurtling from one centered on industry and the production of stuff to one centered on knowledge and the exchange of services and ideas. Will that future economy be a caring or a cruel one? If ideas are at the heart, nothing is more important than the men and women who control the spread of ideas. The old media was driven by and for profits. So what will the new one be driven by? More importantly, what will it stand for? Amy Goodman is the host and executive producer of Democracy Now!, a national daily independent award-winning news program airing on over 1,400 public television and radio stations worldwide. She's co-authored six New York Times best-selling books, including Breaking the Sound Barrier and The Silenced Majority, Stories of Uprisings, Occupations, Resistance and Hope. Her latest book is Democracy Now!, 20 Years Covering the Movements Changing America. Amy, 20 years. Congratulations. Thank you so much, Laura. It is hard to believe. I mean, 20 years ago, this was not our plan. The plan was we were the only daily election show in public broadcasting in 1996, the day after the election. Um, you know, we would end the show and go on to another project. Um, but there was more demand for the show after the uh, election than been before. And I think that was because of the hunger for independent voices. And the fact that, I mean, when I got the call to do, be the host of the show, in I Haiti, was right? in Haiti. I was in a safe house covering people fearful that if they declared for office, they would be gunned down. If they went to vote, they would be gunned down. And yet most people voted in Haiti. In our country, I get this call and say, huh, most people don't vote. Why bother? But I didn't think it was apathy. And I was really challenged by this idea. People care in the United States if they know. That's the issue, if they know. That's right. And also, what were people doing in their communities? Why wasn't it getting covered? And so that's why we use the primary system as a way to go to the states and see what people were saying. And I think it was that hunger for authentic yeah. voices, not the know-nothing pundits. So a lot of people want to know not just about the origins of the program, but your origins. You didn't just spring fully made into the set of Democracy Now! What well, can you tell us about who gave you the idea that you could do this work. Who inspired you the way you inspire us? I mean, my family had a tremendous influence on me, my mother and my father. My dad was a local ophthalmologist, um, and he not only was a great visionary as an eye doctor, um, but he was chosen as the head of the task force to integrate our schools. We had a diverse community, but we had the railroad tracks. And how would we go to school together, black and white together? And I went with him to the auditoriums and cafeterias of our community. I was in fifth grade. He had death threats against him, a thousand screaming parents. But he just judicially navigated, um, judiciously navigated our community through a very difficult place. And my mom would, taught women's history and literature at local community colleges. And, you know, it would be local cops and firefighters, truck drivers who would take it so that they could make more money, more credit, more money for their salaries. And so they would go through the course offerings and, oh, chiclet, like women's literature. Nothing could be easier. I'm going to take that class. Mm -hmm. So they'd come into Dorothy Bach Goodman's class and she would introduce them to Toni Morrison and Virginia Woolf. And this is the beginning of the women's liberation movement, and they would be reading these books. Oh, that's why my wife is so angry at me. That's why my daughter won't talk to me anymore. And soon they'd be bringing their wives and daughters. By the end of the class of a semester, the room would be packed to the rafters with whole families. Mm -hmm. And then she decided to go into family therapy. Um, she was a very resilient woman. But my parents were great role models for me and my brothers. And, you know, my extracurricular activity at school, junior high school, high school, was the newspaper. And I saw, as my brothers did, how, you know, you write an editorial and suddenly the principal has to answer your demands. And then we took it to a bigger stage after that. You know, in high school it's the principal and now it's the president. We should say that the book is co-authored by one of your brothers, David Goodman, and also Dennis Moynihan, of course. Um, introducing people to each other is kind of what we do. I think, in the media at our best. Uh, but there needs to be a door open to get into an institution that supports you and helps you grow in, in this business. For you and me, I think, it was WBAI. It's not been easy keeping that publicly owned community station alive. And it's part of a network that's seen its share of troubles. Can you talk about that? 
Why do you think it's been so hard? I mean, it is so important, Pacifica's roots, uh, going back to World War II and the first Pacifica station, KPFA in Berkeley, founded by a war resistor who came out of the detention camps named Lou Hill, who said there's got to be a media outlet not run by corporations that profit from war but run by journalists and artists, and that's how Pacifica was born. KPFA, the first station, in 49 in Berkeley, KPFK in 59 in Los Angeles, our station, New York, WBAI in 1960, 1970 KPFT in Houston, and 1977 WPFW in Washington. That's the Fab Five. That's the Pacifica Radio Network. And a lot of people talk about crowdsourcing today as if it's a new thing, but that's how they were founded. Oh, I mean, that's amazing, right? I mean, you didn't, couldn't have had a more difficult beginning. KPFA, they, first of all, they're on the air on FM. It's in its infancy. So you had to have a special radio. It was called the subscriber. And finally you get this and you tune in and someone's asking you for money. I mean, that is not a way to begin. And yet they did, and it grew. The KPFT in Houston in 1970, in the spring, it goes on the air, and within a few weeks, it's blown off the air by the Ku Klux Klan. Literally. Right. You write they about it in the book. They blow it up right in the middle of Arlo Guthrie singing Alice's Restaurant, which I thought was a good song. And um, they finally go back on the air after a few weeks. They rebuild the transmitter, and the Klan straps 15 times the dynamite to the base of the transmitter and blows it up again. After many months, they get back on the air in January of 71. And at this point, it becomes a national story. PBS in its infancy comes in to cover it. Arlo Guthrie comes back to Houston to finish his song, Alice's Restaurant, on the radio. And they go back on the air. And, you know, it was the Klan. It was the Klan, the Grand Dragon, the Exalted mm -hmm. Cyclops, I can't remember who. But there was a reason um, why they targeted it, because of the independent voices. Right. When you hear someone speaking for themselves, a Palestinian child or an Israeli grandmother, an Afghan aunt, an Iraqi uncle, it immediately challenges the stereotypes and the caricatures that fuel the hate groups. I'm not saying you'll agree with what you hear, how often do we agree with our family members? But you begin to understand where someone is coming from. You don't want to destroy them. Yeah. That understanding is the beginning of peace. I think the media can be the greatest force for peace on earth. Instead, all too often, it is wielded as a weapon of war. And that's why we have to take the media back. You write about Pacifica Network. It, it is always in trouble. This program looks a lot towards the future. What do you think, based on this story, this experience, we need to change to figure out how community-funded media could be more sustainable going forward? You know, Pacifica Radio is one model, and it's so important. I mean, uh, as we travel around the country on this 20th anniversary Democracy Now! tour, we hold fundraisers That's for right. all these independent media outlets, whether we're talking about a PBS station or a Pacifica radio station or an NPR station. You're so, using the royal we, but that's you. You are on that road. I see you doing the fundraising. It's extraordinary. What and, and it's really exciting, too, because we also broadcast. We're not only you know going to events, but we're broadcasting every day. And it's an incredible experience. I mean, we uh, figured out this is my co-author and colleague Dennis Moynihan figured out a way to broadcast from a place that doesn't have the ability to broadcast out, like, for example, a college TV studio. That's, right. That's interesting because the students there are learning how to do TV, but they can't do a global broadcast from there. Maybe they have closed circuit television or something. But by putting this device in, we turn it into a global studio. And the students are our crew, and they are doing something they've never done before, broadcast out to the world. And it's an incredible experience. It is truly broadening community mm. media. Um, Pacifica, we're celebrating 67 years of KPFA. And all over the country, people are making their own media. And it's a matter, I think, of connecting the dots. I mean, um, we have to take back the media. Mm -hmm. And I think that all of these public spaces, um, public television, radio, public access TV, all over, we strengthen them. We must. Because what is the alternative? We see it. We see this media industrial complex that ices out the voices of not a fringe minority, um, not even a silent majority, but the silenced majority, silenced by the corporate media, which is why we have to take it back. Yeah. We've talked a lot about form so far, but what about content? Um, you have to balance breaking news and responding to that in a different way from the way the other people do. 
with a knowledge that the changes that are required are systemic and need a deep answer, not a quick one. How, how do you decide to, what to put on the air? Well, we made a decision early on we wanted to do a daily show to be part of the national conversation, and things right. do switch so quickly every single day. But there are trends, and it's not only bringing out the voices of um, you know, grassroots activists on the ground, but then also looking at, you know, the movements and how they're growing. And that's the big story that even in this election year where we see the power of movements, I mean, Bernie Sanders did not create that's right. this tidal wave he is riding. Although if you watch the money media, you would certainly get that idea. Right, because they, the movements don't hit the corporate media radar screen. I don't think they know how to cover them for a long time, right? Only when they have a leader. And they, they tried to ice out Bernie Sanders himself, but then it became absolutely ludicrous. I mean, as late as Super Tuesday 3, which was March 15th, that was the day of five primaries. You had Florida, Ohio, uh, Missouri, Illinois, and North Carolina. You had the day that Marco Rubio pulled out because he lost Florida, remember, mm -hmm. Senator Rubio. You had the day that that was the same day as Ohio Senator John Kasich won his first primary. Ultimately, he would pull out. Illinois and Missouri, Sanders and Clinton were neck and neck. Um, and they played every speech of every candidate in right. full, as they should have, right? They had um, Trump and Rubio, Cruz, Kasich, and Clinton. Oh, wait, uh, Bernie <laughs> Sanders? Here, they were neck and neck. And was, did Bernie Sanders right. fall asleep? Right. Did he take the evening off? He was giving the biggest speech that night in Phoenix, Arizona, before thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of people. They didn't even speculate, where is Bernie tonight? Right. So we decided that night, the next day on Democracy Now!, we're going to play an excerpt of his speech. Who would have thought it was a revolutionary act to play the speech of a major party candidate on a major primary night? And that is still covering the speech of the, the leader and, and the, personal, the personal driver of the story. Not the movements that fed into his campaign and what's brought him this far, right? Right. He didn't come out of nowhere. I mean, this is 2016. Look at 2011 just for a moment. Of course, we could go further back than that, but Occupy. Yeah. Um, that is the movement that he is riding. And yes, the police eviscerated the Occupy encampments. And for the media, that was the end of the Occupy encampments because the physical manifestation of them wasn't there anymore. Once they covered that. But after that, uh, you know, movements work in all different ways. They surface, they get submerged, they surface again. And Occupy also became Black Lives Matter, the immigrants' rights movement, you know, all the issues, the fight for 15, all of the issues the equality raises. And as they're oh, morphing in all different ways, uh, you have a presidential candidate that gives voice to them. And so he has... Um, all of these movements that are really there, and he rode that wave. And it's very important, I think, when we look at movements and electoral politics to see what's going to happen now. I was talking to a great group of student journalists the other day and asking them about the nature of American democracy. Some of their views, let's just say, were fairly cynical, but who can blame them? What's your vision of how the media could give people a richer sense of their own potential to make change, to make a difference? When we cover war and peace, not to have media brought to us by the weapons manufacturers. I mean, how many times do you watch Sunday talk shows on the networks and they say, uh, we'll be back to discuss how quickly we should bomb Syria or Yemen um, uh, after this commercial from McDonnell Douglas Lockheed or Martin. from Lockheed Martin or from Boeing? I mean, to have a media that's not brought to you by the weapons manufacturers when we cover war, to have a media that's not brought to us by the oil, gas, and coal companies when we cover climate change, not brought to you by the insurance industry when we cover health care, it is so obvious and so important. Independent media is the oxygen of a democracy. And I think we're seeing this develop all over, people looking for something else. We asked our friends on Facebook um, for suggestions of questions for you, and they were all over the map, but they did fall into a few clear categories, mostly having to do with who do you pick to put on the show? A lot of questions about why don't you have more women of color? Why don't you have more discussion of disability, of Palestine, of sex work? And then a lot of people wondering how you look after yourself. What's your self-care regimen? Uh, do you have one? And, and how do you handle 
having so many people wanting you to be everything to all of them. We don't do enough of anything, I think. And uh, we always strive every day uh, to bring out the diverse voices on so many different issues. And every day we work. And this is, uh, you know, a, what did they call Pacifica at the beginning? A noble experiment. And that's what I see democracy now as. And we can do better every which way. And so we welcome people's suggestions. I mean, in every, when I, you know, when we're on the tour, everywhere we go, make suggestions, issues we should cover, people we should talk to, be specific, give their contact information. That's how we learn. That's how we bring out this great diversity of voices that we can do better on every day. We have, and the self-care? Ah, that's a very interesting question. <laughs> you know, I was invited on the Bill Maher show a couple of weeks ago, and who was there but uh, Ariane Huffington? And, you know, she's the sleep guru. Right. And um, I wanted to challenge her to a duel, like, you know, on the merits of sleeplessness. Yes. But she wasn't having anything <laughs> of it. And I really did say, in June or whenever in the summer, I'm going to take a long nap. But um, I don't know, there isn't time. <laughs> You've not just been a great inspiration, you've been a real support to a lot of journalists coming up in this field. And I want to thank you for, for your support in, in our project um, and ask you, I mean, we're different. We get to go deep, um, focus on a few questions time after time. Any advice for us during the programming that, that we're doing? To keep doing it. I mean, we need so many different programs, platforms, I mean, I see the media as a huge kitchen table, and we need lots of these tables that cover the globe. You must feel the same pressure that we feel to constantly be more succinct, briefer, more Twitter-friendly. But these subjects are deep. How do you, how do you balance that? Uh, I feel that way. I wouldn't exactly <laughs> say we feel the desire to be short and concise, because I think the, the drive, beauty the is others, in mostly. people discussing in their own language and own way. And not to be polished, to have a set answer that you can share in eight seconds, but to hear someone meander, to figure out when someone is, thinks outside the box, to follow them from A to B to Z and wherever else they might go, and to see how they arrive at very different conclusions as we really talking, talk about creating a new world. Amy Goodman, thanks so much for coming in and for your work on radio, on television, and all of your books. For all of you who don't know what you need to know about Democracy Now!, check out our website. We'll post some links. Thank you.